Good morning again. It's great to have you with us always. We're in the book of Revelation. We're learning a lot. Uh, we're encountering some things that we don't have all the answers to. We're hopeful. Revelation shows us the end in Christ. It's, it's all about Jesus Christ. One day we're going to be with him forever. One day we're going to serve him, worship him. We're going to be changed. We're going to be like him. We won't, we won't fight this battle of sin that's in us and around us all the time. It's going to be about Jesus Christ and what he has done. I tell you what, that's exciting. And so ultimately, Revelation is so exciting to see what God has promised for us and what he's going to do. We're in chapter 7 today as we continue through this book. And I kind of used a question to kind of focus our thought this morning and, and what we're going to be looking at, what we're going to see. The question simply is this, to be a follower of Jesus Christ, is it gain or is it loss? That's a good question for us. It's one that needs to be asked, one that we need to ask ourselves. There are two, simul two things happening here in the book of Revelation as we enter into the tribu tribulation. Two simultaneous events are really going on. God is doing two things here. The first thing that we see here in, in this book is it is the wrath of the Lamb. We encounter that. We've, we've already seen that as we've stepped into the tribulation period out of chapter 5 into chapter 6. Jesus is dispensing divine wrath on the earth. That's one of the things that's taking place. Revelation chapter 5 reminds us it's, uh, he is worshipped because he is worthy to open those scrolls, the seals from the scroll, to take that scroll to open the seals. And then we see here in chapter 6, verse 1, that he opens the seven seals. He begins to open the judgment that he will dispense on the earth. It is Jesus Christ is doing all this. And it's very real. It's very real to those who are, who are being impacted by the wrath of God. We see in Revelation chapter 6, as the seals are now being poured out, they're calling out to the mountains, to the rocks. They're saying, fall on us, hide us from the face of him who's seated on the throne. That's the Father. And from the wrath of the Lamb, that's Jesus Christ. For the great day of their wrath has come. It is the wrath of God. Jesus Christ is the one dispensing that, carrying out, fulfilling the will of his Father. That is a present reality. The present reality here in chapter 6 is the context of what we're looking at. It is simply the seal judgments have been unleashed by by Jesus Christ. That first seal is simply releasing the Antichrist onto the scene. He doesn't have the power yet he's going to have in the middle of the tribulation, but he is powerful. He begins immediately to conquer economically, politically, to draw people to himself. As he takes that stage and takes that place, there's a false sense of peace initially after the rapture. He's able to answer questions that the world has. But then war erupts, conflict erupts, revolution erupts. The world erupts, many in the world erupt against his uh, desire to, to, to be the, the one world leader. And so war comes upon the scene. God releases war. Uh, that's part of the judgment of God, allowing and releasing those, those elements. Famine is a result of that, worldwide famine. Uh, you can't, it takes a full day's wages simply, simply to buy food. Not, the, not even the other necessities of life, simply to buy food. That's how extreme it's going to be. 25% of the world population is going to die. That's 1.52 billion people according to the population right now. This is a reality of the judgment of God, the seals of God, the wrath of God upon the earth. There's going to be the savagery of, of martyrdom. Uh, we see that here in chapter 6. We're going to see that here in Revelation. We're going to see that today. The world is going to, is going to, is going to pursue Christianity to the ends of the earth. To try to eradicate it. See, when the rapture occurs... There's no Christians on the earth. They think that they have won the, that battle. Next thing you know, Christians are popping up, and Christians are here, and Christians are there. And the world is going to re respond violently to any who receive Jesus Christ. That's going to be the reality. And then the world is literally shaken. There is a worldwide earthquake. It would seem that all the fault lines of the world go off at once. There is, there is celestial things happening, meteors falling from the sky. So much is going on. This is God's wrath on the earth. He's pouring out that wrath. From Joel chapter 2, we see it is the day of the Lord. That's what we call this. The day of the Lord is many things. It is also in, in the millennial kingdom at the end. It's, it's pieces and parts, but it's, it's the full picture ultimately of the wrath of God. And on the other side of the coin of the day of the Lord is the blessing of God to his people. And so we see that reality here. And so the question that comes out of Revelation as we begin these scenes and move forward, there's a question that just is relevant to, to really all of the book of Revelation, all the way up to the very end of the Millennial Kingdom. It's, it's this question here. It's who can stand? 
chapter 6, verse 17. As, as the world encounters God's wrath, as they understand that it is from God, it is not something else, it's not, it's, there's not some other source, the world comes to an understanding in some way, shape, or form, because it's clearly communicated here in chapter 6, they understand this wrath is coming from God. And the question is this, who can stand? Who could possibly stand from the wrath of God? And so chapter 7 here in Revelation begins to answer that question, and we're going to see that. So Jesus is dispensing wrath. That's what he's doing. But Jesus also is, is offering divine hope. That's the other simultaneous element that's taking place. You have the wrath of God, and then you have, and then you have the grace of God, the grace of the Lamb of God. You have God's wrath being poured out. At the same time, God's grace is being poured out on this earth in a, in a, in a, a huge way. We're going to see that here. Last week here in chapter 7, we saw that grace and how God was pouring that out. Is 144,000 people were sealed. Okay? And so, what, so what God is doing, he's kind of giving us a, a glimpse here as to the grace and how it's impacting. We have 144,000. We talked about that last week. I believe it's Israel, literal Israel. I believe it fulfills what we see in the Old Testament. God's purpose for Israel is being fulfilled. That is to be a, a light to a world who needs the gospel who needs to, who needs the good news of God's transformation in our lives to proclaim God to proclaim him in the earth to declare his glory among the nations uh, his marvelous works among every people all peoples that's what Israel was intended to do intended to be and now they're being uh, they're being put into a place where they will begin to fulfill that purpose that God designed for them as a nation Prophecy is being fulfilled in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24. We see this. The gospel is going to be proclaimed throughout the whole world to every nation. And then, that, and then the end will come. There is going to, this is the greatest gospel revival that has ever taken place in the world. What is taking place here during the tribulation, more people are coming to Christ than ever has in, in this world. You think uh, the Billy Graham Crusades and, and the Louis Palau uh, crusades and, and other gospel oriented crusades of giving the gospel around the world where thousands upon thousands of people are there and yet, and yet that doesn't even begin to touch what God is doing here God is a God of grace I want you to see that you know God allows hardship to come into, into our lives he allows hardship to come into the life of the sinner he uses hardship to draw people to himself and when God takes away all the answers that man has and when God takes away uh all the things that we normally turn to and the coping mechanisms that we have and that we find them to be insufficient, when we have nothing else to turn to, God has us exactly where he wants us so that we can see his grace and see that his grace is sufficient for our every need. People are going to come flocking to Jesus Christ, but the cost is going to be extremely high. Even Israel, Israel itself as a nation is now being drawn to the Lord. They will be saved. We saw this in Romans 11. Right now there's a remnant of, of Israel's, uh, there are Jews who are being saved, but the nation as a nation is not drawing to the Lord. We are in the time when the Gentiles, until the rapture occurs, folks, I believe that can happen at any minute biblically. When that happens, the time of the Gentiles comes to an end. And then God's going to return his focus to Israel. Part of that tribulation is to bring Israel back to him and, and for Israel to fulfill its purpose. And Israel is going to be saved. Israel is going to be delivered. God is going to touch the hearts of Jews and Israel and bring the nation back to himself. And the, so we're reminded here in the midst of wrath, Joel chapter 2, this great day of the Lord, there is grace. That everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. As we said last week, this is picked up in Romans 10, verse 13. And yet the context here is the wrath of God. God's grace is always there. When his wrath is being poured out, his grace is always there. That grace ends the minute we take our last breath on this earth. When we die, when the Lord brings us home, the grace for the unbeliever ends. There is no other opportunity. As long as I'm alive and breathing, there is grace around me all times that God may touch my heart, that I might respond to him. All this is because of Jesus Christ. He gave his life. He shed his blood. That's why he is worthy to open the seals. You ransomed people. You freed them. You paid the price that I couldn't pay, that they couldn't pay, from every tribe, every language, every people, every nation. That's significant. 
And so God, God has always left himself a, um, a faithful witness on this earth. Here we see in chapter 7, those who will be witness for him, giving the gospel for him. This is just a piece of that picture. We're going to see more of this in Revelation. We've not seen the whole picture yet. But God has always had a faithful witness. Acts chapter 14, verses 16 and 17 remind us that God has never left himself without a witness. Even in the Garden of Eden, he walked in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve. And then we, and then we have the, the witness of creation. We have the witness of God's daily blessings to simply people, to all of us, to humanity. We have the, the witness of his word, his written word, into our hearts. We have the witness of Israel. We have the witness of the church. We have the witness of every believer, all believers. We have the witness of the conscience, which he has placed within us. We are born with the witness of God in our hearts. We, we can harden our hearts to that. We can quench that. That witness alone doesn't save us. We still need to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't have inherent goodness in us because of that. That's simply the voice of God in our hearts, the conscience of God, which we must respond to in faith to be saved. He has, he has given his works, his signs, his miracles, here his wrath, his, his visible demonstrations of who he is. He gave us the greatest witness or ever has been and ever will be, Jesus Christ himself, our Lamb, our Savior, our Lion of Judah, our King of Kings. He is the greatest witness, declaring the Father to us, declaring eternal life to us, that we might have life in his name. The angels here in Revelation are going to have witness. We have the 144,000 that are witnesses. We have the two we have the two witnesses we're going to encounter later in Revelation. God has never left himself without a witness. That's why he tells us in Romans chapter chapter 1 that every man, woman, and child is without excuse. We will all stand, you, you, I, we, all of us will stand accountable before him because he has left a witness before every individual who has ever lived. And they have had an opportunity to respond to that witness by faith or not, to be drawn closer and to yield to the work of the Spirit of God to bring them to faith in Jesus Christ. Every one of us has had that opportunity. And so the grace of God is seen in, this, in these 144,000, these literal Jews from Israel, that God seals, that God seals as servants of God, and then multitudes are being saved from all around the world. Now these multitudes, we're going to see, we're going to read this, the multitudes are not the church. I believe the rapture has occurred. Jesus has taken the church home to be with himself, Revelation 3.10. Because you've kept my word, you've patiently endured, I will keep you. That's a specific church, but it's the seven churches. It's us, his church. It is the church age. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world. The whole world's going to be impacted. That trial never occurred during the time that Philadelphia received this letter. This is, a, this is the great tribulation. This is the great day of wrath. He is going to, he's going to remove the church from that day of wrath. We've talked about that when we were here. And, and the wrath will be poured out on those who dwell on the earth, those who have hardened their hearts against him. This is not the church. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17 remind us of that reality. The Lord will descend from heaven with a shout. The dead in Christ will rise first. Those of us who are alive will be lifted up, will be reunited with the Lord. This is the great tribulation from the great tribulation, Revelation 7, verses 13 and 14 here in this passage. One of the elders addressed me, John says, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes? And from where have they come? And I said, Sir, you know. So we have the 24 elders. They prompt a question in, in John's heart. They know that John has this question. John's hesitant, fearful to raise any questions. He's in the very presence of, of God and of these elders and the, and the four living creatures and the angels. And, and so he prompts this and then he answers it. And he says, and these, he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. These, these multitudes who are being saved are martyrs. They are coming out of the great tribulation. We see that in verse 6, chapter 6, verse 9, verse 11. I saw under the altar souls of those who have been slain for the word of God and for the witness that they have borne. We saw that in chapter 6. They're fellow servants and they've been killed. And so heaven is being filled as John is receiving this vision. Heaven is being filled in this scene from, from martyrs who are being killed, those who are followers of Jesus Christ. They have, they have received Jesus Christ as Savior. This revival is hitting the world. People are being saved. 
in spite of the great cost, in spite, in spite of the danger, there comes, a, there comes a great clarity in our life when God takes away everything in our life that's valuable, when he takes away everything that's meaningful, when it becomes clear that God's displeasure is being poured out against man, there becomes a stark choice. What will I do? Will I turn to the Lord or will I run from him? And many will turn to Jesus Christ and receive him, and then the cost will be their very life. They, their, they, their lives will be slaughtered. They will be killed because the Antichrist, because the leaders of this world, because their neighbors, their family members, their co-workers will hate them, turn them over, they will be killed. If you are a Christian during the Great Tribulation, it will be, it will be an experience on the run continually, being a living testimony, being a witness, but being on the run. And Revelation chapter 13 reminds us that this multitude, these martyrs, they're, they're conquered, they are defeated. The beast, that's the Antichrist, was given a mouth. He was uttering haughty, blasphemous words. He was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. That's, that's three and a half years, the second half of the tribulation. He, his, his evil intent will come to a full fruition in the second half of the tribulation. And God, Jesus Christ, allows him to make war on the saints and to conquer them. Who is allowing all this? Who is, who is in control? Who is sovereign? It is Jesus Christ. He is allowing the Antichrist, he is allowing the beast to have his way with Christians here on earth. He is allowing the slaughter to take place. And he conquers many Christians here. In other words, he kills them. He catches them. He kills them. He has them executed. Here's the beautiful thing, because it just reminds me of when Jesus Christ went to the cross. Satan had him where he wanted. Satan took his life. It was over. Satan won the battle. He was victorious. And next thing you know, Jesus is in hell proclaiming victory. Next thing you know, Jesus rises from the dead three days later. The same thing is true here. Here it looks like, like the Antichrist has won Christianity is being eradicated, as it were, but it's not. Because in Revelation 12, we see this. But they, they, this is all believers, this is really all of us, not just the martyrs, all of us. We have conquered him. Him is Satan in this context. We've conquered him. We've con conquered the enemy. We've conquered the devil. Because the Antichrist serves at the, at the behest and power of Satan. We as believers, we conquer him as Christ conquered him at the cross. Why? By the blood of Jesus Christ. By the blood of the Lamb. We conquer Satan because of faith in Christ, because of being a child of God, because of living for Him and by the word of their testimony. We've conquered by being faithful to the end, which reveals genuine faith in our life, authenticity, authenticity of relationship. We belong to Jesus Christ. For they love not their lives, even at death. And so what we see here is many, many are coming to Jesus Christ. The cost is their life. The cost is the loss of their job. The cost is the loss of everything, their homes, their livelihood, not being able to buy, not being able to sell, hardly being able to function, having to run for their lives. Is it worth it? That's the question, isn't it? We have an amazing scene in this text. What we see here in, in this chapter 7 is, is pure worship. So let's look at that together. There is, there is an exalting of the Father and the Son here together. So let's pick it up. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. And after this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne. Here we see here the multitudes are standing before the throne of God. They are, they are worshiping. Uh, they, they are in the presence of God. What a, what a beautiful thing that we see here. In verse 9, as well as we continue, it says, and they have palm branches in their hands. There's, that is, a, that is a, a figure of celebration. That is, that is a figure of, of, of um, adoration. Just as Jesus Christ came into Jerusalem, there were those in that crowd who were genuinely worshiping him. Most of them wanted a political savior, but there were those who genuinely were worshiping him worshiping him to lay down those palm branches was to was to give him the highest honor this is this is giving god highest honor palm branches in their hands celebration joy absolutely worship is taking place in verse 10 it says and they are crying out with a loud voice i love that crying out with a loud voice you know what it doesn't matter what your personality is personality is you may say you know what i'm just i'm a quiet i'm just a quiet person i'm not that i'm i'm not the kind of person to be expressive and to, and to be like this but you know what God's going to rise us above our personalities. 
We are going to stand there like these martyrs someday. We're going to be before the Lord. We're going to do the same thing. And we're going to shout, and we're going to, and we're going to cry out loud, and we're going, to, we're going to raise our voices as high as we can and exalt Him. And the joy will just pour out of our life. That's what's happening here. There's joy pouring out of their life, and they are crying out praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what they're doing. Not only that, they're not alone. Verse 11, And all the angels were standing around the throne. Chapter 5, verse 11, we see this here. They were, uh, they were um, angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands innumerable. In verse 11 here, we see in chapter 7, all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne, and they worshiped God, saying, Amen, or so be it. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And there is, they are accompanied by the angelic host. I can just only imagine how, how beautiful, how immense all this is that's taking place. The martyrs are in the midst of this, singing praises, living, lifting up adoration to the Lord, shouting out praise to Jesus Christ, to the Father. Not only that, what else are they doing? In verse 15, they are also serving God. As they worship Him, they're serving Him. I don't, I don't know what they're doing. I, I see what they're doing here. They're, they're singing praises, and they're before the throne, and they're lifting up Jesus Christ and the Father. In some way, they're serving Him. I don't know what that means. I don't know what, they'll be do, what they're doing. I don't know what we're going to be doing, necessarily. We have clues. In this scene, I don't know what they're doing, but they're serving Him. You know, God's called us to serve, and He's called you and I to serve Him. There's great joy in that. There is, there is fulfilling joy in serving the Lord. Here that joy is being realized and fulfilled. And so we have this, this scene of worship. And not only do we have, not only do we have this scene where just, just pure, un, un, unadulterated worship is taking place. It's not like, it's not like a rock star. It is, it is God himself. It is the creator of the universe. He is king of kings. It is Lord of lords. He, he is the one who saved us, redeemed us by his own blood. It is the sovereign father who... Who, who allowed all things by the will of the Trinity. It is God himself there that we, are, that we are praising and lifting up. And there is a reality here. The reality is this. There is eternal relationship that is expressed. They are worshiping God because of who they are, what he has done, what they have in Jesus Christ. What, they have, what have they received? What's, what's now true of them? They've given their life. They've paid the highest cost. They received Jesus Christ in the tribulation. They followed him. No matter the cost, the highest cost was giving their life. They gave their life. They freely gave their life. And now they're in the presence of the Lord for eternal, eternity, for all eternity. So what do we see? What's the, what's the reality? Well, we see in, in verse 9, they're, they are before the Lamb. They're before the Lamb. They have access. They have access to the throne of grace. You know, we do right now. Right now, as we pray, as we open the Word of God, as we talk to God in prayer and bring our needs, we have access to the throne of grace. Now they, now here they are literally before the throne of grace, before the one who is the author of grace, the source of grace. They have access to the very throne of grace. Also in verse 9 we see this, and they are clothed in white robes. They, they have experienced the full righteousness of Jesus Christ. They are now completely right with God. There is no sin that stands between them and God. All sin has been erased. The sin nature has been erased. They are now right before God in every way. You know, that's, that's my hope. That's your hope in Jesus Christ. There's going to be a day when, when I, when you, when we in Christ are going to stand before Him, clean and pure. Our sin is going to be behind us. That battle is going to be behind us. The warfare, the struggle is going to be behind us. We're going to be in the presence of the Lord. How beautiful that is. In verse 10, as we continue, we see this. And... And they were crying out, salvation, salvation, salvation. They have been delivered. Salvation here is deliverance. They've been delivered from, from the horrors of seeing the wrath of God. They've been delivered from the horrors of what's taking place in this world, from the horrors of having to, to run for their very lives, to, to exist only. They've been delivered from that, and, and they've been delivered ultimately into the very presence of God's salvation. They have been delivered. That is privilege, folks. We see also in verse 10, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, the blessing of God's presence. In fact, in verse 15, we see here, and uh, they, they, are, they are before the throne of God. They are before the throne of God. 
And so they are blessed. These, these who have paid the highest cost or have received the highest blessing being in the very presence of God. Right now we're in the presence of God as we open the word. We are in the presence of God every day as we serve and live and breathe. When we open his word and we lift up our voice in prayer, we're in the presence of God. Everything that we do, good and bad, we're in the presence of God. But to be in the presence of God one day and to have that sin nature removed, I can't wait, folks. To be in the presence of God and have sin behind us. To be in the presence of God and, and to view him and to, and to see him and to understand him without the sin nature, with, without the, the, the crushing nature of sin, always pulling at us with that behind us and seeing God really for the first time, how beautiful that is. That's a blessing. Folks, that's a blessing we can't even put words to. We can't even describe it. In verse 14, we see this. As John responds to these elders and they tell him who's, who these martyrs are, they're the ones coming out of the great tribulation. He says, and they have, they have washed their robes and they have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They are now experiencing the fullness of salvation. They have been cleansed. They are washed. They are clean. It's amazing, this picture here, isn't it? In blood, they have been made white. In the blood of Jesus Christ, they have been made white. As Jesus Christ shed his blood, he became the, the, the perfect sacrifice for sin. He became the one who could, who could bear the wrath of the Father against sin. He took our place. And he, purged, he purges sin in our life, and he removes its stain in our life. He gives us new life. And here, finally, in heaven, we experience that new life. The fullness of salvation. The peace of salvation, the joy of salvation, the completeness of salvation, whatever you want to say, how beautiful that is. <sighs> I love it. And then we and then we continue. And it says in verse 15, and they will serve him day and night in his in his temple. We saw that they're serving him. It's day and night. We're they are, we are, when we receive those new bodies and we're in heaven, we're with him, we are free from the limitations of our past body. Our past limitations. I, I have so many limitations right now. I have limitations in my body. I have limitations in my spirit. I have limitations in my mind. I limit myself. I lack faith. I doubt at times. We are limited in so many ways. When, when we are in the presence of God, he will make us whole. He will make us new. He will remove the limitations that sometimes define us now and impact us now in everything that we do. Folks, that's promise and that's hope. I want you to keep your eyes focused on what God has promised because it's coming. It will be worth it all. We see that reality. And then in verse 15, he continues, and he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence and they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any scorching heat. You know, many have experienced these very literal things having just gone through and experienced the wrath of God on the earth. They've been protected from the wrath of God. By grace, they've been saved, but they've lost their life. Maybe because of the impact of, of these seals, maybe because of execution. Well, it says here they've been martyred, right? So, so we see here that they are, they have given their life freely, but they've seen the devastation of God's wrath on the earth. And they have experienced that firsthand, seen that in the world around them. And God says, now they are free from hardship, any kind of hardship. God is now, a, God is now here sheltering them with his very presence. Hardship can't touch us in heaven. Adversity can't touch us in heaven. Difficulties of life, which are so much a part of life now, it's part of our witness. It's a part of our testimony. It's a part of what defines us. It's a part of what, of what reveals our authenticity in Jesus Christ. How we use those, how we respond to those, how we let God use those in our life. When we're in heaven, those things will be behind us. That's the reality here. And then in verse 17, we see this. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. He will guide them to springs of living water. That's just satisfaction, folks. Eternal satisfaction. Living water. Being satisfied will never be unsatisfied again. Will never be empty again. Will never be searching again. Never be groping. Never have doubts. Never have uncertainty. We will be satisfied in Christ. 
everything will be, every question will be answered. We will not know everything. We'll not be God, but we will be satisfied. We will be in Him. Do we really know what it's like to be satisfied day in and day out? We know satisfaction from the Lord right now. It's one of the great strengths in the life of believers is the peace of God, the joy of God, the wisdom of God, which brings which brings the satisfaction of God into our life, into our experience, into our walk of faith. But to know this satisfaction in totality, to not have sin again pulling at us, showing us another glimpse, pulling us another way, to be satisfied because now sin has been defeated for all time, the enemy is dead to us, and one day here will be as well. And then in verse 17, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Freedom from pain. The tears here are tears of grief. The tears here are tears of pain, of sorrow. Those are going to be removed. They're going to be, they're going to be taken away. There's something beautiful about what's going on here. This is the passage. We have the 144,000. God, God keeps his promise to Israel. He is now restoring Israel. As part of that, he chooses, he chooses 144,000 specifically. He seals them that they might serve him. One of the ways in which they serve him is, I believe, because we have the 144,000 and we have the multitudes back-to-back context. And when the next thing that we see here in, in verse 9, after the 144,000 are people being saved all around the world. How can we not believe but these 144,000 are being gospel soul-winning witnesses for Jesus Christ? And they are reaching the world, and people are being saved because of their witness and because of their testimony. I believe that's exactly what's taking place here. Because of their faithful witness, people are being saved. And, and, the, and the gospel is going out, and multitudes are being saved, but the cost is so high, it is giving their own life. That's what's taking place. I don't believe these multitudes are an amplifi- amplification of the 144,000. I don't believe that the 144,000 and the multitudes are one and the same. I believe you have, you have literal Hebrew Jews from Israel that are sealed in, in, to serve God. And you have people from all nations, including other Jews, that are being saved. Only 144,000 are sealed to serve in, in a specific way. The rest will be saved just like the Gentiles will here in the tribulation and will have to potentially give their life. Not everyone who receives Jesus Christ as Savior in the tribulation is going to lose their life. But a vast majority of them will. There will be new believers who walk into the millennial kingdom who survive. But many, many, many will give their life. So what do we learn here in this passage? It's beautiful. It's the gospel, folks. It's just the gospel. It's Jesus Christ. What do we learn here? What do we take away? What's significant for us from the life of these martyrs? Well, here's a few things I want you to think about. Number one, God's wrath is real. It, it's promised to be, it has been, it will be. God's wrath will be unve- unveiled against all unrighteousness, against those who are ungodly, it says here, against those who suppress the truth. How many, how many times has God given opportunity to, to, to people who need the Lord? How many times has God given opportunity to you? Every time, that, every time that I hear the gospel but I don't respond, I suppress the truth. Every time I suppress the truth, my heart gets a little bit harder. My opposition gets a little bit stronger. Every time I suppress the truth, I grow in greater danger of not having that opportunity to believe in the first place, of not letting God allow my heart to become tender. Today's the day to respond to Him. Today's the day to receive that gift of of salvation, that gift of good news, to become a child of God, to confess sin and to receive grace and forgiveness and washing. God's wrath is real. We see that here in Revelation. The martyrs, they understood that. They saw that. They saw God's wrath firsthand. They saw the impact of God's wrath firsthand on the world. And they experienced man's response to it. Man's response was not only hatred to God, man's response was hatred for all Christians. These are martyrs, not only in the six seals, but in, in, in the rest of the tribulation to come. This is a, a comprehensive, complete look that we see taking place. What else do we learn? God's grace is a gift. These who receive Jesus Christ understand that. They become grounded in the gospel. The power of the gospel changes their life. They have found there's nowhere else to turn. Where else can I go? All the gods of this culture aren't the answer to the wrath of God that I see taking place. I have no one but God. And they and they have given their life to Jesus Christ. And it's true today. At the end of the day, really, we have no one to turn to but Jesus Christ. 
Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but by me. There are no other answers. There are, there are no other paths. There are no other solutions. There are other, no, no other ways to get to heaven. Jesus Christ is the only way. That's going to become crystal clear when God's wrath is being poured out. It's clear today, but sometimes the distractions of life and, and the, my ability to choose what I want to do in this life, it, it, it clouds my mind. It deceives my mind. The sin in my, in my life and the sin around me, it deceives me, prevents me from being able to understand and to see. May God open my eyes. That's your prayer. God, open my eyes that I might believe. In Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Grace is being poured out. Here's what we see also from the life of the martyrs, their example to us. We see, uh, we see a life of yielding. That's simply what we see here. Titus chapter 2 puts it this way. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. That's the very first step of yielding. When I receive Jesus Christ as Savior, I yield to him. I yield to his authority. I yield to what he says about me, and I believe it by faith, that I'm a sinner and I need him. I yield to the truth. I yield to the gospel. I allow him to change me. I allow him to come into my life. I yield for the very first time to God. That's the very first step. The grace of God trains us. It trains us to renounce sin, ungodliness, worldly passions, to live for God, uh, self-controlled, upright, godly lives. The, the, the grace of God leads us to be trained. We yield to God's training. We, lead, we yield to God's shaping in our life. He's continually shaping me. He's continually shaping those who are his children, that we might be, become more like him. That we might say no to sin and say yes to his plan and his will for our life. That's the key. The grace of God teaches us yielding continually, teaches us to be patient, to wait. God hasn't come back yet. These scenes that we're talking about right now haven't unfolded yet. The people still need the Lord. And that hope that refreshes needs to be the driving force in my life. I need to keep my eyes continually on what God has promised and what he calls me to now so that I will live today in light of God's promises that will be fulfilled tomorrow waiting for Christ to come. Because he's coming, I will live for him. And grace leads to this reality. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness to, pur to purify us for himself. Just reminds me, I yield to him. Him first. It's to him I yield. He gave himself to purify us for him. He wants us to live for him. I yield to his ownership. We are his possession. We belong to him. He, he wants us to be passionate about doing his work. Grace teaches me to yield. That's what it does. These who gave their lives learned that they were yielding their life as they gave their life. They were yielding their life as they followed a difficult and hard path to their end. They understood that this was God's call for them, that they were to be faithful to the end, to yield to God's will, his plan. He will be sufficient for them then. He will be sufficient in his promise that we see in this passage in giving them everything he ever promised. Yielding ultimately brings life, John 10, 10. A thief comes to kill, to destroy, to steal. I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The thief is always trying to steal in our lives. The riches of God's grace, he's trying to steal in our lives what God is doing and undermine it and undo it. Jesus Christ came to give us life, to fill our life with joy and abundance. It changes us, folks. It becomes the driving force, the life of Christ in us. Paul says, walk a newness of life. Walk a newness of life. And yielding not only brings life, yielding does this. It reveals the very presence of God. When you and I are yielding, when we're practicing yielding to God's will and yielding to who He is, we reveal to others who are watching our life, we reveal into our own heart that there is a genuineness of relationship, there is an authenticity. We reveal that God is present in our life. If you are choosing to yield to God, then what is true is that God is real in your life. His life is in you. He is changing you, conforming you to the character of Jesus Christ. God, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Jesus gives us every opportunity every day to honor him. He wants us to honor him. As the, as the martyrs gave their lives 
to honor Jesus Christ, a living sacrifice, allowed their lives to be poured out for him. Galatians says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. We honor him by letting Christ live in our life. We honor him by living by faith. I live by faith in the Son of God. We honor him by reflecting his love for us. He loved me. He gave his life for me. This is how we honor him. Jesus Christ, have your way in my life. Jesus Christ, give me the faith to walk day by day, step by step. Jesus Christ, remind me over and over and over and over and over again how much you love me, what, what you did for me, what you want me to do in response. That is so important. We honor him by making choices in our life. We choose in our life gain over loss. This is what the martyrs had to decide. Was what they were doing, was the path that they were on, was the relationship that they had stepped into, was that gain or was that loss? Philippians, Paul puts it this way, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Here it's gain. It is gain when we are willing to give up everything in our life. It's gain when we are willing to give up anything in, my, in our life so that God can do his work in our life. Paul says, Whatever defines me, whatever you saw in my life that drew you to me, whatever was, whatever was my reputation, whatever was commendable in my life, if it detracts from my ability to reveal Christ, then I count it all as loss. I want to give up anything that will hinder my ability to reveal and show Jesus Christ. The martyrs were there in that place. Paul continues, why? Because it's worth it all. Jesus, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Savior. I want to make Jesus Christ my Lord. My Lord. My authority. My accountability. It's gain. It's gain to follow after Jesus Christ. To let Him take the lead in your life. It is always gain when a believer chooses to let Jesus Christ lead. Whenever a believer says, Lord, to you I am accountable, to you I will follow. It is always gain. It says that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own, but that which comes through faith in Jesus Christ. It's always gain when we let Jesus Christ be our identity, to define our life. Not a, not a label, not an experience, not what I do for a living, not who I'm married to, not all the things that I've done in my life, but when my identity is Jesus Christ, I have gained the most. And Paul says that I might know him, that I might know his power, the power of his resurrection, that I might share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that even if it requires my life, I want to know him that way. That's what Paul's saying here. Not that I have to die to be a Christian, but he's saying, if, if I need to know Christ better and death is a part of that, I willingly embrace that. That's no different than the martyrs who gave their life for Jesus Christ. For them, gain was to know him, no matter the cost. What about you? What about I? That's our life. That's our testimony. What about that in our life? We have to make a choice every day. Is it gain or is it loss to follow after Jesus Christ? Is it gain to get out of bed and be with God's people to go to church? Is that gain in, our, in my life? Is it, is it gain in my life to carve out time for prayer? Or is it loss? Is it, is it gain in my life to let God's word truly change me? Is that gain in your life? Or is that loss? Is it gain to be faithful every day? Or is that loss? Is it gain to follow God's path for your life? Or is it loss? Is it gain to give God control of your life? To let him take the wheel? Is that gain in your life? Is that positive or is that loss? Is that a negative? Is it gain for God to take you out of your comfort zone so that he might use you? Is that gain? Is that positive? Is that productive? Is that negative? Is that a loss? Is it gain to remain true to God no matter what the pressure, no matter what, what forces are coming at me? Is it gain to let go of sin in my life, a sinful habit, a sinful path? Is it gain? Is it positive in my life? Do I view it that way? 
or is it a negative? Is it loss? Is it, is it gain? Is it positive to live counter to the values of the world around us? Or does that mean loss? What's my choice? Is it gain for my children to pursue following after Jesus Christ? To give their life to Jesus Christ no matter the cost? Is that gain for me? Is that a loss? Is that a positive? Is that a negative? Is it gain to yield to the Lord? These who receive Jesus Christ during the tribulation, they have to answer that question. What's worth more? Taking the mark of the beast? Aligning myself with the Antichrist? Going with the flow? Surviving? Survival of the fittest? Or is it better, is it gain to give up my life, to receive Jesus Christ as my Savior, to follow after Him? Every day, the choices you make throughout the day are revealing that reality. By how you live your life, are you saying by your life that Jesus Christ, following after Him, is positive in my life? It is gain. It is what I pursue more than anything else. Or have the choices of your life revealed this? It's not worth it to make those hard choices. To put Jesus Christ out there as my identity. To follow after Him. To do what He would have me to do. What do your choices reveal about your view of who Christ is in your life? Of the worth and the value that you place on Jesus Christ? Is it worth it to give Him everything, no matter the cost? That's the challenge from today's Word to us, the Word of God into our life. Multitudes are being saved, but when God saves us, He saves us to a path. That path is the glory of God. May He put that on your heart as a child of God. May He touch your heart with grace if you've never received Jesus Christ as Savior. Thank you for joining with us. May God bless you and challenge you in these areas of living for Him. Amen. Amen. See you next week.